Players. 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 Player zone. Player zone. Player's own voice. Player's own voice. It's Player's Own Voice, a podcast from CBC Sports. Paige Lawrence is a proud daughter of Kennedy, Saskatchewan. While you try to find the town of 200 on a map, let me say that having a big dream while living in a small town is no trivial accomplishment. Part of Paige's lasting legacy in figure skating is helping young athletes believe that they can succeed no matter where they are from or how few resources they seem to have around them. Lawrence stayed in Kennedy through medals in Canadian championships, four continents, Grand Prix finals, and Olympic competition. And she says her on-ice fearlessness comes straight from an upbringing in a rodeo family. We're going to get to that, but my name is Anastasia, two-time Olympic speed skater. Spoiler alert, we're going to start this chat at the conclusion of a career. And unfortunately, it's not a fairy tale ending. Let's start at the Olympics, because that's where we met. Mm-hmm. You lived the Olympic dream. Mm-hmm. You were one of one of the cutest little candid moments uh, coming off the ice, going to the kiss and cry. Your coach goes, how did it feel? What do you say? I had two moments at the Olympics where I forgot that there were TV cameras, and I believe after my first skate, I said... That was just so much fun. Like, I had so much fun out there, and I was just kind of blabbering in the moment. Great throw, <laughs> triple lads from Paige. Oh, she's going to be so happy she did that. <laughs> Great job by this Saskatchewan Paris team. Paige Lawrence from Kennedy, Saskatchewan. Rudy from Kipling, Saskatchewan. I think that the character was really, you know, perfect for her. She's amazed at every new thing that she sees she's come to life and every single thing is new so and she didn't have to act much because i think that's probably exactly how she felt out there on the olympic ice the second our second performance i uh i just said like i didn't want to get off the ice like i was gonna curtsy forever and i would have like i think i would have just kept curtsying to each individual person if my partner had you know tugged me that it was time to get off the ice but it was just it was my moment and I was soaking it in for all that it was okay she's gonna they're not gonna want to get off the ice you just wait (laughs) they're they're soaking it in here I'll just bow one more time yeah look she's like do we have to go do we really have to go two months after the games what happened I ended up losing my partner that I had spent the last nine years of my life skating with um, and ended up having to retire. I, I couldn't find another partner. And so two months after the best moment in my life, like I'm suddenly in what could over dramatically be one of my worst moments of my life. Mm-hmm. And why did you lose your partner? Just, it's a, I mean, it's a very long story, but to condense it for this moment, like, we ended up having a very unhealthy relationship, is what I would call it. And it, it just spawned from the strange dynamics that a pair team requires. You spend so much time with one another mm-hmm. in a very stressful environment. And people respond differently to stress. People people act differently, like, on the daily basis. And, and my partner and I, we just had very two different outlooks and ways of doing things. And over time, like I said, nine years of, of that, um, kind of just, it built up to a place where we weren't helping each other. Why not, why not just get another partner? So in skating, like every other sport out there, there's righties and lefties. And I happened to rotate clockwise. So everything I ever jump, every spin, I'm spinning in a clockwise direction. And my partner had to spin the same way. So luckily I found someone that did. Um, but the majority, like large majority of figure skaters rotate the other direction. And so suddenly it wasn't a matter of having to find 
a male figure skater, which is already a minority in the sport, but it was finding a male figure skater who rotated clockwise, and uh, for whatever reasons, it, I just uh, was unable to, unable to find one. Does that haunt you? <sighs> Haunting is not the word I would use. Um, it's it's something that I will always have a piece of me, like wishing that I could have explored, because the Olympics and World Championships, which were three weeks after the Olympics, were my two best competitions, mm -hmm. which is really, I'm so proud to stand here today and to be able to say that, like that my two best competitions were at the largest scale of competition. Um, so I really felt like I was kind of coming into my own. I was 24, just turned 25. Um, and I felt like I was kind of owning who I was as a person. I was taking it onto the ice. I was, I was able to get into that place where I was competing for myself and for the right reasons. Um, so I think it would have been really interesting to, to see where that went, to have had the opportunity to really finish that, that growth. Everything happens for a reason. And my life has taken me to some really wonderful places since then. So it's hard to, to look back and say, I wish things had gone differently. I will look back on it with a curiosity. I mean, you say you have no regrets, but you must have had resentment, though. You must have been angry. I remember, so I retired in 2014, and it was at the end of 2016 when it was like I was doing the year in review. Like, there's still parts of me that will be forever an athlete and how you, you know, you stop and you look back at your your year and um, assess and evaluate like where you're at, where you still have to get to. And it was at the end of 2016 and I was looking back at it and I was kind of like feeling pretty low because I'm like, what have I accomplished? I mean, there's people out there that are two years into their four year, the next four year cycle that, you know, like I, I still held myself to a certain standard. And it was then that I, I had the realization that I, I had learned how to be happy again. Mm-hmm. I, I had found like the new balance in my life and like the ebb and flow of just where I was and the acceptance of of having to had to have moved on from figure skating and that love of my life. Um, and so it, it took me a long time to get to that place where I was able to say like I was happy and I was in a good place. Um, not to say I was like <clears throat> dramatically like rock bottom for a year and a half. I wasn't. It was always, it was, I was always putting one foot in front of the other, but just internally, it, it did take me a while to get to a good place. Um, I'm not very good at figure skating. No, she's not. Good. But as she's... a fellow skater, <laughs> it, it warms my heart to hear that. from Kennedy, Saskatchewan, 200 people deep, Pride of Kennedy, alongside Colleen uh, Storics. Yeah. I mean, in a sport that's so defined by kids having to move to a cosmopolitan training center, do you gain inspiration knowing that you've broken down barriers, that you've told kids, hey, mm -hmm. if you're from a small town, you got a dream and you're willing to work hard, you can go to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just backtrack because um, Colleen Sestorics, you might not know, um, in my town of like, let's be real here. Let's give it, let's give Kennedy three to 500 people, even though I've been giving it 200. I know we're going to just help it along a little bit more <laughs> in a very small populated town. Um, Colleen Sestorics went to like two or three Olympics. So I yeah. grew up in this small, small environment, uh, having this like real life role model she, like saying that it can be done that it is being done was just a small little golden nugget in in my world of possibilities for me now standing on the other side of the journey being an olympian it is for sure like one of my greatest dreams is to be able to give back to other small town kids because like you said that you reach a certain point in your sporting career where it's expected for, and I, I speak from a figure skater's point of view, it's expected for you to move to a larger training center, train with the best athletes, train with the best coaches, yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. And for us, like we really went the opposite way for that. Like we, we stuck true to our roots and we just did things that worked for us. And, 
and we, I, I went to the Olympics with the coach that I started skating with when I was nine years old, mm-hmm. who had no pairs training experience. Mm-hmm. Like we actually had a TV VCR on the side of the boards and we were watching competitions and we were pausing and like learning handholds and, and like slow moding and like teaching ourselves. So like, wow. it, it's a really cool story um, that I won't bore you with right now. It's not boring. Um, but for me, it was just like, if I, if I, when I have the chance to talk to people, the biggest message I could think I could send is like, it's, it's not the resources. It's not about the resources that you have available to you. It's about the resourcefulness of you and your team, um, and your desire to make it happen. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I think it's easy to limit yourself or, or to say it's impossible due to what's around you or what's not around you. And I think that my story is a really cool way of showcasing like if you make the best of what you got knowing that you kind of are the product of of two supportive <laughs> parents you know uh leanne and jimmy mm. rodeo folk yeah. dad owns a rodeo business buck and broncos you betcha i want to know what do you think is more influential in your life uh the rodeo lifestyle or the figure skating lifestyle because from afar it looks like they're a little bit of a juxtaposition. <laughs> it's, I think I'm a great blend of the two. I really do. Uh, it's funny because in like the figure skating world, I, it, people used to call me farmer, you know, cause, <laughs> <laughs> because I was just very comfortable like it, with me being who I am. Like I'm, I was never great at politicking or anything like that. Like I would be comfortable talking to judges with my hair in like a messy bun. You know, I'd go down for breakfast at an international competition in my sweatpants and frog slippers. Like, comfort first, you know? Safety third. Safety third. That, that, was, that was my motto. And that's, <laughs> that's the, that is like the rodeo coming in. And I, you watch any um, old videos of me at, that was aired on TV and the commentators at one point in time every competition would be like safety third that's her motto because i embrace that like mm-hmm. i that, that's my dad side of me like we're on the ranch it was it was you just you get through stuff like you get hurt cowgirls don't cry like you know get, your, get up brush yourself off like live and learn from the experience if it didn't break you then figure it out how to move on from it kind of thing and i, I loved the thrill of pair skating like i i fed off of the adrenaline and everything that came with that like I had no qualms about someone saying like let's turn you upside down and throw you in the air and like you dive and then we'll catch you and flip you around like I was like yep let's try it you know so safety third jokingly it's not a joke (laughs) I I lived with her for two years we were roommates (laughs) but I I think to go back to the point of like the combination of of both Growing up on a ranch gave me a work ethic that I took onto the ice with me every single day. Mm-hmm. I was not a talented young athlete. Like, if you were to ask my coach um, that I started skating with and took me to the Olympics, at nine years old, though, if you would have asked her if, if I had a chance going to the Olympics, like, she'd be the first one to tell you that she would laugh in your face. But I worked my butt off, and I loved figure skating. And I, I have to say that my love for figure skating combined with the the values and the work ethic that my parents raised and instilled in me that's why i went to the olympics like mm-hmm. it's it was it's just like the perfect storm of of country meets figure skating well maybe you're going to get like a that sounds like a movie i page <laughs> not i tanya it's i page <laughs> oh. you just got to hit someone you know girl you sitting right next to me oh watch a sail <laughs> <laughs> um, but you are a shining example for for just being a little workhorse, but also love, like genuinely, purely loving your sport. I'm not going to lie when I say that every single day I stepped on the ice. And, like, let me just preface this with there were some poor days that I stepped on the ice and was dealing with a lot of things that I would rather not be on my plate. Um situational like with my relationships you know um just a lot but every single day I stepped on the ice I took my first two three laps around the ice with some good tunes playing to myself and I took a moment to just feel the love in my heart for what I was doing 
And then I would face the rest of that, whatever that training mm-hmm. day held for me. And I know that sounds like a bit like fluffy and whatever you want to call it, but that's the, that's the God's honest truth. I took that mm-hmm. moment every single day for me as, as my reminder of why I'm doing this. Obviously, knowing that Patrick Chan has retired, reading between the lines, there might be kind of a changing of the guard. Where do you see the sport going in in Canada? Watching the Olympics this year was hard enough. Like, the first time, you know, like, not being there. Um, But also recognizing that I could possibly be watching for the last time the group of skaters that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very, like, it was a very sad moment because from here on out, it's going to be different for me watching and it's getting different for the sport, but I have to say that we have some great young superstars coming up, and I hope only for the best uh, for what's what's to come and what they have to show us. As much as it was exciting watching these superstars and like the big names of the sport, how cool is it to have that that new field come come in and just to see where they can take it? What do you never want to see change about figure skating? Mm. That's a really, it's a, it's a tough question. One of the things that I am proud of, for, of in our sport is the extreme difficulty of the moves that we're doing. And yet the, the need to make it look easy and to make it look effortless and beautiful. And it's this wonderful combination of, of strength and effort and athleticism paired with performance Mm -hmm. and I just think that that's a really cool thing that figure skating has going on and in the pursuit of raising the bar and taking everything to the next level athletically I hope to see that that the performance and the art side of the sport isn't lost and that's that's a fine line to walk because it I mean it was exhausting and demanding when I competed so it's I am I am already <laughs> admiring in advance uh, of what's to come, but I just hope that they can do it in a way that they really maintain that that beauty and the art and the performance side of it and keep that combination hopefully in a little bit of a balance. Do you ever see yourself coaching or dipping your toe into choreography or or even analysis? I love figure skating and if that hasn't come through in this this chat that we've had (laughs) I'll just go on record and say it now I love figure skating so at at some point in time I've just recently I was coaching and I I took some time away from that to really focus on like building my own business and and developing myself outside of my sport but I, I hope to get to a place in my life where I can find a way to welcome figure skating back into it outside of a fan status outside of a team I I am still doing some team leading with Skate Canada which is amazing opportunity um but I would like to I would like to find a way to to bring it back in 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 some way but that's something that I I really don't I don't have like a specific goal in mind for that that's Mm -hmm. just kind of like to to come what may I guess what is the single most important lesson that sport has given you Sport has given me the the power to be authentically, genuinely myself. And I love myself in a very, like, I'm not trying to be egotistical in any way, but I do love myself. And it has given me the confidence and helped kind of prepare me to take that out into the other world because you're under such a very concentrated, like very, um, like a microscope. Mm -hmm. And so all of your flaws, everything is brought to the surface and it's either going to make you or break you. And so for me, sport really helped make me. And so I think the thing that the lesson that I learned the most is that you have to love yourself for everything that you are and, and everything that you can be. It's love yourself and you'll figure the rest out. You know, no one's perfect. Uh, 
that's what the Olympics taught me is that there's no one there that's born an Olympian. Everyone has their own story. Everyone made it happen one way or the other. We're all just born people. And so if you can just see yourself for who you are, love yourself for who you are, and then commit yourself to something and work really, really hard for it, like the world's your oyster. Thank you very much, Paige Lawrence. 2014 Olympian. Just won a bunch of medals. <laughs> it's not about the medals. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, baby Paige. Paige Lawrence and I recorded that conversation in Calgary, Alberta, a little before the snow started to blow. Before you go, just a reminder, if you are a fan of hockey or storytelling, then add the Hockey Night in Canada podcast to your list of must-listen-to podcasts. Rob Pizzo catches up with many of the colourful characters within the sport as they reminisce about the great moments and players of the game. It goes way beyond just the stats and scores. Players Own Boys podcast is a CBC Sports production. Email your comments to us, playersownvoicepodcast at cbc.ca. Social media, hashtag playersownvoice. I'm Anna Stasher on Instagram and Twitter. Our producer is David Giddens, and Graham McDonald is our sound mixer. Thanks for listening.